Okay, um, welcome everybody to our council meeting. I just first of all, uh, Karakia, if we like, can we put that up on the screen, please, Harriet? Fakataka Thank you, everybody, and welcome. I'm just quickly going to hand over to uh, Chief Executive David Holtman and then to Corin just to make some um, introductions for staff. Um, well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is our first council meeting for the, uh, the new year. Um, I just wanted to start with welcoming some of our new staff members to um, the council and just um, identifying them for what just identifying for the councillors. Um, firstly, our, our new um, planning pol our policy uh, manager, um, Karen Yates. She's joined us from um, South Warrior District Council, um, and she's been here you know, six weeks now. But seven. Seven. Seven weeks, yes. Seven weeks. And she's um, joined the team on um, here at the SLT. Um, I've also, I'll hand over to Corin. Um, he's got some um, some staff members too that he can introduce. Uh, kia ora, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So yes, just uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce, um, we've got three new people who have started since um, or December in community development. So we've got uh, Kelsey Rutini, uh, who's the community development team leader. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see her there somewhere on your, your screen. Um, and Antonia Kilmister Thompson, who started as one of the community activators, and also Ali Todd, who um, some of you will know from her shift work, who is also uh, one of the community activators. So they're the the and the community development team. And it also was hoping to have online, but I don't think he's here. Um, Alistair McDonald, who um, has started as assets officer in the facilities team. So that's um, the the role uh, in the team which looks after the um, the various facilities and the work, the uh, uh, asset work that happens on, on those facilities. So um, he started at the start of um, January and it's great to have him in that role because um, we know we had a bit of a delay in that space while we were filling that, um, which has enabled us to get on. So I'd uh, just like to welcome them all to the, um, to the organization. Thank you, Corin, and welcome to all the new staff members. Great to have you here. Just moving on to the agenda item number two, conflicts of interest. Members to declare any interest on the agenda items. This, and the protocols, as you are aware of the Zoom, under reactions, there is a ra uh, raised hand, and if we can use that, if we want to speak, please. So, I'm not aware that there's any conflict of interest. I need to declare, oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Nixon. Uh, yeah, just Todd Edron. Okay, I need to declare one, and that is uh, for the uh, notice of motion on the agenda regarding three waters. It's a non-financial conflict of interest um, because I've got a conflict of roles being on the three waters uh, working group that is uh, preparing a report to go to the minister. So that is a conflict of interest, a non-financial. So I just wanted to check with um, councillors regarding that item. Um, I am, will not be voting on that item and I will not uh, be discussing it. But I'm quite happy to chair, chair that part. Um, if, if there is any objections to that, please raise your hand. And if there is an objection to me chairing it, but not discussing or voting on it, then I will hand it over to Councillor Johnson as chair of infrastructure. Is there any objections to me chairing it? 
that's right, Walters. There appears to be not, uh, no objection, so I will chair it and as disclosed, will not be discussing or voting on that item. Moving on to apologies. Uh, have we had an apology from Ra? Uh, no, because I'm online. Oh, sorry, Ra. I didn't see you. You're right down in the bottom of my screen. Um, sorry about that. Okay, and Chris, good to see you um, looking so so well. Um, so, and great that you could join us today. Moving on to item number four, it's the public forum. And we have got Legging the Ladder Down Charitable Trust and welcome to Nina, Antonio and Trudy Helena. I'm not, and Tony Hargott who is here. So I'll hand over to you and welcome. Sorry, who's leading? Sorry, that's me, Lynn. Sorry, just having a bit of um, technical issues there. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui atu um, ya tātou. Hello, everyone. Uh, I acknowledge you uh, who worship the chair, uh, councillors and office officers, and uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to see you today. So by the end of this presentation, I would like you to know that who we are, uh, why we exist, uh, what we do to realise our vision, and uh, Tony uh, Hargood, one of our trustees, will also just finish off with short words about um, the collaborations that we do. So can I just double check that I can um, share screen? Yes, you should be able to, Mina. Okay, so um, I just... Is that coming through okay? Yes, it is. Okay. So um, here are our trustees. Um, I have with me um, us in virtual person, uh, Tony Hargood and Trudy, which most of you will know, and myself, I'm the chair and the founder of Leaving the Ladder Down Charitable Trust. Our activity started about five years ago, and uh, we formalised as a charitable trust in uh, 2020. Um, why we do what we do is that we see an equitable world. Uh, is that, I just wonder whether that's changed. Uh, has that, can I just double check that that's changed? No, it's still on the uh, beautiful photos of your wall. <laughs> okay, that's for some reason is not. Um, Okay, I might just read my notes rather than, and you'll just have to put up with our lovely faces. So we do this because we haven't, we see an equitable world, which is more than what a fairer world is. So studies show that equity and not equality is what brings about the level playing field. And equity is what directs the right amount of resources and gives the right access to people who need it most. What we believe in is that everyone has the capacity to live well, but not everyone gets the right opportunity or access to do that. We want to change that. So we have we operate a community whānau model where we have our young parents and our um, and we have mentors who are community leaders from across our region uh, who come from a cross sector of business, um, trusts. Uh, and um, in the community sector. And we do one-on-one -on -one training, uh, mentoring, as well as group mentoring with our teen parents. So we also have an in-house uh, program where we visit our, we come together with our teen parents once a month and you, I mean, once a term, and that's usually in the, uh, in our teen parent uh, unit, which is up on Markora Road. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have a public leadership talk series, which we've held and some of you um, would have attended in the past. The community whānau model, we've just added recently a wise guardians group. Uh, a lot of our, uh, our uh, model relies on growing um, the networks for our, for our teen parents or young parents rather. And so we've added the wise guardians and the wise guardians is a new group. Uh, mostly made up of retirees, uh, but what they do is that they complete that model where they add their networks and influence and also provide wise counsel. 
Uh, our diverse and inclusive relationships are all based on trust and learning from one another and breaking down barriers. We also have our public talk series. Um, some of you would have come around, um, may have attended last year's one, um, Gilbert Inoka down at uh, Carterton Event Centre, which was a sellout and um, very popular. And uh, this year, uh, our talk, which is coming up next week, is uh, the uh, refugee migrant Abbas Nazari, who's written a bestseller called After the Tampa, and that's taking place next week um, down at Carterton Event Centre as well. So we have been impacted by COVID as many other events have been. Um, and so usually we sell out over 200 uh, attendees or tickets to these events and we have limited to 100 this year. Uh, the access also to come together with our students have also been impacted, but we've been able to pivot in other really um, exciting ways. And so any opportunities that we can to come together, we do. Um, Last year, or actually um, two years ago, we were also um, gifted with uh, the um, the karakia that was written by our patron, uh, Dame Joy Cowley, and uh, so she remains with us, and it's a taonga that we uh, truly treasure. So that's us, um, and I will hand over to Tony to just talk about the collaboration with um, with his uh, with the rugby club. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for the opportunity um, to speak. To, so, for people who don't know, I'm Tony Howgood, Chief Executive of Wife Bush Rugby Union. Uh, Wife Bush Rugby Union got involved um, with the trust a, about four years ago, um, and we sort of formalised it a bit more over the last couple of years. And um, also, I've become a trustee in the last twelve months. Um, when we looked at the trust. Um, we got pretty excited around the board table um, about what the, the TPU were doing. A huge investment in education, the mentoring, the community connection. Uh, and the one that really got us was the building of the resilience of, of, of the people involved. Um, as you may know, may not know, we, we have a motto in the rugby where rugby is more than a game. So the connection into the community just sat really well with our ethos of what we were doing. Um, being part and supporting the um, the talks, um, and for people who've been there, they've just been they've just been amazing. The, the, the quality of the people, and I've, I've uh, on many occasions had people you know come up from the street and just say, look, you know, I learned so much, or I found a, a new way of looking um, at, at life uh, from those presentations. But when we get back down to the, the people that we um, are helping and mentoring, I think it's the mentoring that really um, is, is the positive aspect. And in my very short time involved um, with the trust, um, to see some of these um, people come through and go on to you know, better things and doing things and building the confidence is just, it's just really amazing. And um, uh, I just really you know, wanted to share that as much as possible on a personal level, um, but also I think the work of the trust is just incredible what it does in the community. So thank you, Mina and Tony. Is, is you open to any questions that councillors may have? By all means. Okay. Uh, any questions that councillors would like to ask? No, there doesn't appear to be any. Thank you very much. I'm well aware and have seen firsthand um, the work and the difference that you're making. So uh, thank you very much for, on behalf of, I suppose, our community for all that you're doing. So thank you, Mina, Tony, and Trudy. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So moving on to our agenda, item number five, late items for inclusion under section 46A7 of the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act. I'd like to put, um, ask that the Chief Executive's KPIs be put through. Uh, they have been finalised and would rather than come through here than have to wait for another month or so. So could I have somebody move that the Chief of Sets KPIs be included as a late item? Moved by Councillor Nelson, seconded by Councillor Ryan. 
All those in favour, please raise your right hand. Okay, motion is carried. Thank you. Moving on to the next item, uh, the items to be considered under section 48.1a of Nagoima, uh, minutes of the council meeting held at the public excluded on the 15th of December, report of the audit and risk committee held at the public excluded on the 16th of February, and now the chief exits KPIs, that those items be considered and public excluded. Uh, could I have somebody move that we accept those items? Moved by Councillor Nixon, seconded by Councillor Holmes. Councillor Peterson, I wasn't sure, was that to move or did you have a question? Sorry, you're on mute, Chris. Oh, no, I was just confirming it, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded that we consider those items and public excluded. Did I put the motion? I don't think I did. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your right hand. Against, the motion is carried. Moving on now to item number seven of the agenda, the confirmation of the minutes of the council meeting held on the 5th of December. That's on page 101 of your agenda. The minutes are there. Um, is there somebody that would like to visit? No questions on those minutes. Could I have somebody move that they reflect um, true and accurate record of the meeting? Thank you, Councillor Nixon. Seconded, Councillor Mailman. If there's no questions, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your right hand. Against. Motion is carried. Moving on now to the next item, which is on page 301, the, oh, I'm sorry, just a sec, the report of the Infrastructure and Services Committee held on the 2nd of February, page 301. I'll hand over to the Chair, Councillor Johnson, to take us through the report. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, there was nothing uh, particularly um, to, to report, except we did receive updates from infrastructure and also from community facilities. And we also extended our agreement for the COVID vaccination parking for the DHB and the council car park by the departmental buildings to the 30th of June. So I'll take that, um, and that was it really. So any questions of the chair? There is none, so you're happy to move uh, the report and the recommendations with enough? Yes, I'm happy to move. Is there a second up? Councillor Cafell. Oh, um, all those in favour, please raise your right hand. Against, carried. Moving on now to the audit report of the Audit and Risk Committee held on the 16th of February, page 401. Uh, I will just quickly take us through this. Uh, we had a, the presentation of the uh, report back from audit on the year end of the 30th of June and the introduction of, of, of the new auditor uh, who will be replacing uh, John. From that meeting, we also talked about the procurement policy, and um, you can see that on the agenda, the discussion that we had around the procurement policy and the uh, audit and risk committee ex accepted that and endorsed it. The service provision report was came from um, Aratoi and Aurora, and there are more details on the financial aspects of that that are held in um, Stella. The non-performance um, report was for the second quarter was put forward uh, and the six months to date financial report and the health and safety report. Is there any questions on that report of audit and risk? There appears to be none, so I will move that the report be accepted with the recommendations contained within. I will move that. Is there a second that? Is that you giving a thumbs up, uh, Councillor Gear? Great. 
Okay, it's been moved and seconded, so I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Or raise the right hand, sorry. Okay, against, motion is carried. Moving on now to the first item for decision is the notice of motion on the Three Waters Memorandum of Understanding. As I said earlier, I have um, declared a non-financial conflict of interest uh, on this. And I, so I will not be taking part in the discussion and I will not be uh, voting. So I would like to go to uh, Councillor Nixon if you want to um, propose the motion and then seek a second. Of the X has got her hand up, Your Worship. Okay. Oh, sorry, Councillor Johnson. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I just thought um, relevant to Tina's notice of motion today, just to bring up a couple of background things that were in our infrastructure meeting in November, one of which you'll obviously be aware was the establishment of the working group of which you're a representative and there are council representatives from out, throughout the country. And that working group is recommending to government an alternative design and also to address concerns expressed about the current model. And at the same meeting, our council agreed to jointly submit with other councils in the Wellington region on economic regulation for three waters reform. So I'm just reminding people of that. But the other thing is, at the same time in November, the MOU that Councillor Nixon is bringing up today from Communities for Local Democracy, which is a group of partner councils, I think there's 25 in total, was circulated at that time as well. So whilst it's not new information, I do think it's important, though, that, that um, we realise that some councillors have signed that MOU individually. And so I think that's important prior to Councillor Nixon's discussion, because I, for one, have signed it as an elected member, and Dave, Councillor Holmes has also told me that he has. But I think we, before we discuss it, it'd be helpful to go around the table to see who has already shown their support for the MOU. Okay, is there um, just following on from Councillor Johnson's suggestion, is there um, indication of who else may have individually signed that MOU? So as discussed, so it looks like it's Councillor Home, Councillor Johnson and Councillor Nixon. I'll hand over to Councillor Nixon now for her notice of motion. Thank you, Your Worship, and please, um, this is the first time I've ever done this, so if I um, muck it up a bit, um, uh, please bear with me. Um, so um, this notice of motion, is, um, as Bex has highlighted, is actually, um, in some respects, we've looked at it before and we considered not doing it. Um, I think the lot has changed over the last few months. Um, and even in this last week, there's been yet another delay from the government in terms of introducing the legislation, which would indicate that things are not all well in terms of that proposal. Um, and I think even since November, I've had concerns that we really should have put our money where our mouth was in terms of um, what I consider probably the overwhelming support of most councillors um, and or not support, a lack of support for the reforms in their current form, um, as we've seen them in the last iteration. Um, I take into account that the mayor is a part of the working group. Um, but this is a chance for councillors, councils to work together to find alternative um, models as well. Um, and I don't like the idea of other councils carrying all and carrying the workload, I suppose, and us benefiting from it either. Um, so I'm uh, also a member of the, the Water Users Group, which is a public, um, a, more of a public group um, of water users. Um, and I still have some considerable nervousness around this and want us to have as many opportunities as we possibly can to make an impact on what this will look like um, in its final iteration. Um, so uh, that's about it from me. Okay, I'm going to suggest, Councillor Nixon, that you move um, your proposed motion on page 121, and then I'll ask for a second, and then it can be open for discussion. Um, so I move the motion um, as read. On page 121, 1, 2 and 3. 
on page 21, 121 and 2123. I'm happy to second. I'm, no, I'm Sorry, I missed that. I'm happy to second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded, so it's now open for discussion. Uh, Councillor McLean has his hand up. I actually had my hand up to be the seconder, so, um, and I missed that. Max is too quick. But I guess seeing as I'm speaking very briefly, everyone's quite clear where I stand. The, um, the work that the previous Labor government did in the early 2000s up to the introduction, introduction of the Drinking Water Standards 2008 um, seems to have just been lost. And that's what I firmly believe, going back to the capital assistance, technical assistance program and the, the, the work that was done is the way forward. So I'm supporting Tina and Nixon on this. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. I'll then go to Fraser, uh, Councillor Mailman, and then Councillor Holmes. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I certainly support the motion, um, but I also support the intention to, to improve the safety and the quality of the drinking water and to improve the environmental performance of all three waters. But the process the government have used uh, to date has been, has been, to me, very, very poor. Um, they have provided insufficient information, nor allowed a lot of time for local governments such as ours to understand the implications of the suggested model. Should they go ahead as they indicated they will, I believe we will have little representation on the governance group of that entity that we are, um, are in at the present time. The more councils that come on board to support the other councils, the stronger will our voice will be. And so I have no hesitation in supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Malman. Councillor Holmes? Yes, likewise, um, Fraser's taken a lot of my words, but I'm right behind it. Um, I just think there's, it's such a complex, um, complicated situation that we're in and it needs the, the time spent on it. So I, I fully support it because we're talking about a long-term objectives here. I'd just like to ask Council Nixon, the water group she's on, is that the Waiata Water Users or is it the National Water Group? Because she can answer, answer me, please. The, the um, Water Users Group, it's W U G. So it's the national one. Oh, yeah, it's not the Waiata Water. Okay, thank you. And I really support it. Councillor Nelson. Um, just a question for you, Chair. Can you just briefly explain to me what the role of the working group is? What is being achieved through that process? Okay, as I've said, I'm not taking part in the discussion on this. I'm just chairing it. The terms of reference are on Stella. Um, so um, the group is, the Three Work Waters Working Group has been established around gut to strength, that look at strengthening the governance, representation, and accountability. So the terms of reference are on Stella, um, as are all the minutes of every meeting we've had. Thank you. Um, just to say, I won't be supporting this motion, and that's based on what I saw, and remember that all the councils took part in the discussion and presentation from Jason Krupp and the benefits that he shared with us um, regarding Three Waters. Also, the presentations that I've seen that I think many other councils have seen from Victoria in Australia and Tasmania in Australia that um, extolled the benefits of this type of process. And also what I've seen personally, just with the, just the water situation in our town and even on the street where the school I work is at, um, clearly there's systems in place that aren't working with the current model. So I will not support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Is there anybody else that wanted to speak to us? Uh, Councillor Peterson. Yeah, Gerard, I, I won't be supporting the motion either. I, I think to a large extent, you know, this um, proposal really came out of the, the initial response when we were still sort of um, uh, reeling under the government's um, um, proposal. And but uh, but I think when you we, when you realise the scope of what what is being proposed all the way up to Tamana Otawai and, and trying to fit it in with a holistic um, uh, approach to, to all waters. Um, I, th I think it's just, 
the the scale of it is uh, um, is beyond just just the the the, the quite narrow um, uh, scope of of the brief of Tina's brief or of the Coalition for Democracy's brief, and and I think yeah that um, you know we just it's I, and, and, I, and I like like uh, Tim I, I really think that we need to recognize that that um, this has been going on for a long time and that local government have been lobbying and um, have to all intents and purposes won some concessions from government and the major concession is is this um, uh, committee that 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 our mayor is on and uh, along with several other mayors and they seem to be covering uh, a lot of the the um, or, or uh, the um, concerns of the of the committee. So, um, I, I mean, I'm impressed if you have a look at those papers on Stella, the 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 amount of of work and the the um, the amount of detail um, is is frankly um, bewildering. Yeah. So I won't be supporting it because I think it's all already. Uh, the concerns are already in hand and have been taken up by government, and they uh, they have given their commitment to to hear all and evaluate all options. Thank you, Councillor Peterson. Uh, Councillor Cafal. Uh, thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm in two minds over this. Uh, from my own point of view, yes, I, I I do support the notice of motion. I believe that the government has handled this really badly and that we need to take a stand. But the problem I have with it is that um, we haven't really consulted with our community. Now, I know that a lot of the people that have spoken to me over the, well, since November actually, have been very strongly against what the government is doing. But it's been interesting in the last few days since this has been given a bit more publicity or the last 24 hours actually, that I've had calls from a number of people who have said to leave it alone to let the, uh, to let the uh, thing fall into place and then decide what we do. So uh, I've, I've got some misgivings about it because, I, you know, as you people would know, I'm very strong on the consultation of anything. And we haven't really asked our community here what they think. And so that, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting, on the, sitting on the side, sitting on the fence a little bit on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cavell. Uh, Councillor Nelson and Councillor Peterson, I see you've still got your hand up. I don't know whether you was that just you haven't put it down yet. Is there anybody else um, that wanted to speak? I think um, Chief Exec, did you want to speak? Yeah, uh, I just just re reiterate our, the position we're actually currently in. Um, in, in October, the government announced that it was going to go forward with these four entities. Um, if you recall, we made a submission um, really um, showing our disquiet, I suppose, our concerns about that proposal. We asked a whole lot of questions um, of the DIA and the government around the reforms and how they would affect us locally. This, um, the DIA have committed to um, answering those questions. We're expecting the answers in a couple of weeks. Um, they did, admittedly. <laughs> um, we were going to um, answer them last uh, last month, but um, they've obviously uh, been more held up a bit. Um, and they have also set up, a, um, based on those submissions, uh, this governance group that um, the Mayor is, is currently on. That group is also due to report back to council in a couple of weeks' time um, to, the to the minister, and then with the idea that that would then um, influence the direction of, of um, the minister's uh, thinking on the, this whole reform process. So um, we, we, we are currently waiting for further information. Um, we, we haven't done a lot of community engagement in this space, uh, mainly because we haven't had a lot of information to engage with the community. Um, we don't know as a if, if a council policy we should be actually um, should our council policy change from answer our questions um, to um, we're we're opposed to the to the to the word. So um, 
given that we haven't had a, a, a of a lot of community feedback, given that this is a policy change, um, and the fact that if we sign the MOU, we are sort of committing ourselves to um, uh, the, the voice of that group. Um, we do have to uh, um, agree, or we're only one vote in that room um, with the direction that they're doing. Um, I, I would. I would recommend that perhaps before we change our policy on this, that we do have, um, we wait for the information that is pending and the decisions that come out of that. And then, um, then with our eyes open, um, make a decision on which way to go. Um, I know that's, um, that's uh, some councils haven't gone that way, but certainly um, our recommendation is, is it's, well, my personal recommendation to the to the uh, council is let's um, wait. Um, information is coming in the next few weeks. Um, let's know what we're saying no to before we do it. Um, but if, was there anything else? I... No, nothing. Uh, thank you, uh, David. So, is there anybody else that hasn't spoken that wishes to speak, um, Councillor Nixon? Um, I'd just like to take some uh, uh, issue with some of the points that um, uh, the Chief Executive has raised. One of the issues that I have is there's near, very narrow terms of reference in, res in regards to the group that the Mayor is on. Those have been reiterated yet again by the Prime Minister's speech. She specifically announced the four entities. Um, and the, so they are frozen in time. And um, that is one of the major concerns of all of the councils. It is that is not the only working model. I have been a reformist right from the outset of this process, from the first time that I was interviewed about a month after we were elected. Um, I said right there and then that we needed water reform, just not necessarily the reform that this government was, was um, promoting. We've been waiting a long time for answers to questions. I have no faith that there is going to be a timely response to anything. So we have to join the group that has the loudest voice and the group with the loudest voice is this group of councillors. Uh, so um, from that perspective, um, I, I don't think I've got anything more to say other than it, I, I, I don't think that we're going to get any joy out of the group that Lynn's on simply because of the terms of reference narrowness. In terms of the, of the community being engaged, that is another issue. And I mean, that's one of the issues all the way along. We really haven't had a chance to engage our communities, but unlike um, Councillor Caffell, all of the, um, the feedback that I've had is that we need to have an alternative to the model that is currently being proposed by the government and hasn't really altered. Okay, so there's no... Oh, sorry, was that no. feedback? If there's um, no further discussion on it, it's been moved and second, seconded. So I'm going to put the motion um, as per uh, the uh, recommendations on page 128 uh, that Council approve the following uh, amendments to criteria and process. For the, oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. Um, page 121 that agrees that yeah, Masterton District Council become a partner council. So one, two, and three on page 121. So I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour, and just for the record, uh, for Harriet, I am not voting. Um, please raise your right hand. Those against? Motion is carried. Okay. Thank you. Moving on now to page 128, the awards and grants, delegations and proceeds. Okay, so you have you have the report in front of you. Uh, Corin, is Corin online? Yes, he is. Uh, Corin, did you want to speak to the report at all or take it as read? It's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, um... We'll take the report as read. It, it, it's fairly uh, uh, self-explanatory. Um, the recommendations come from um, conversation um, through the, the committee. Um, so um, just open it up for conversation. Okay, thank you. So is there any questions from councillors to Corin on the report? Any questions? Mm -hmm. 
It doesn't appear to be any. Is there somebody prepared to move the recommendations on page 128? Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Holmes. It's been moved and second, seconded, so now open for discussion. Any discussion on the report? No hands up. Okay, the report has been uh, moved and seconded as per the recommendations on page 128. So I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your right hand. Those against, motion is, sorry, Councillor Gefell, I assume that that was for, not against. Okay, um, the motion is carried. Okay, moving on now to item number 13, the re review of the Wairapa local alcohol policy. Um, you have the report in front of you. Uh, Narissa, is there anything that you would like to state about the report? Um, yes, please, Mia. Um, kia ora tato. Um, so the Wairarapa Local Alcohol Policy is a joint policy with Carterton District Council and South Wairarapa District Council. Um, this is the first time that we've had to review this, po this policy with it um, first being developed um, in 2013 and then it becoming operative in 2018. Um, the Wairarapa Local Alcohol Policy it includes maximum trading hours and discretionary conditions for each type of alcohol licence. The policy also includes restrictions on off-license premises in relation to schools, early childhood centres, playgrounds and recreation facilities. Licensing inspectors at each of our three councils are responsible for monitoring compliance with this policy. In our district licensing committee, they must consider this policy when they make decisions about, about alcohol licensing applications. We've pulled together a cross-council project team with MDC leading the review work. We are currently progressing a review of current data and research on alcohol-related harm, as well as a stop take of wider upper alcohol licences. In terms of stakeholder engagement to date, we have spoken to the police and our licensing inspectors and officers. Um, we're currently not in a position to recommend either a rollover of the existing policy or to recommend amendments at this stage. We feel that further stakeholder engagement, data gathering and investigations of issues raised in initial stakeholder feedback is needed to help us formulate advice on the review approach going forward. Um, our next steps um, will be developing a more detailed project plan based on the keys, key tasks and deliverables that are um, outlined in attachment two to this report. Um, we'll also be progressing our review of the current data and research on alcohol related harm. Um, we will be developing a communications and engagement plan to support the review and undertaking further engagement with key stakeholders. Um, we plan to provide review updates to council as part of um, this chief executive's report. And the report will be considered today by South Wairarapa District Council and is going to Carterton District Council's meeting on the 30th of March. Thank you, Narissa. Uh, so you have the report in front of you. Is there any questions that councillors have of the report? Councillor Mailman? Yes, I see the final meeting for the policy group is on October 22nd. Um, and I'm just wondering, given the elections uh, happening at that time, whether the it might be prudent to bring it further forward by about two weeks, so that the final meetings in September. Um, yes, we had a discussion about this this morning that we're going to have to relook at those um, timelines, especially during that prep period. So um, that's something that we'll follow up on. Okay. Uh, any other questions? No, there appears to be uh, none. Is there anybody to move the uh, recommendations on page 132? Councillor Gear, seconder, please. Councillor Mailman. 
So the recommendations are now the motion is listed on page 132, A, B, C, and D. So I'll put the motion. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Those against. The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, staff. That was a comprehensive report. And I do remember it well from back in 2013 when it first started. So thank you. Okay, moving on now to the next item on page 155 is the Civic Facility Project Committee Terms of Reference. Uh, so, uh, David, are you speaking to this? Oh, oh Phil, I'm sorry, Phil, I can see you there. I'll just hand over to you, Phil, if you want to uh, add anything to the report or speak to anything in the report. Thank you, Your Worship, and good afternoon, councillors. It's very nice to see you all. Uh, no, I think the report is read. I'm happy to answer any questions. I might just highlight the fact, though, as, as discussed in the report, that we've, we've sort of moved on since we last had looked at the terms of reference. We've now appointed the architect and the other uh, lead consultants, and we're currently engaging in the process to go through with the subject matter experts to start working on the details of the design with an with a intention to come back with a, a brief back to the councillors from the architect. So this is really about trying to expedite that process and, and make it as, as efficient as possible as we as we go through that design iteration process. Uh, so happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Phil. Is there any councillors have any questions on the report? There is none. So the recommendations are there on page one. Is that a question, Councillor Nelson? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was just a little bit slow with my remote. Um, Phil, just a question in regards to option three and um, in the one of the cons, it says the quorum will not be updated, meaning that potentially only one elected member would be involved in making recommendations resulting in reduced governance and political oversight. So at the moment, the committee can only make recommendations. Um, with this, if this was to go through, would that mean that a quorum of two would be able to not make recommendations, but pass things through without recommendations going straight to council? We recommend a quorum of, of four for the uh, for the committee. Uh, it's currently five, but dropping that down. So, so the issue we've got is if we don't have, uh, if we don't make those changes, option three, if we don't make these changes, you could be in a position of having uh, one, one councillor plus the two external uh, consultants plus the two EV representatives forming the quorum. We're saying the quorum should be changed to have a, a minimum of two councillors on that quorum. Oh, I see. I'm just reading. I, and, and, and keeping it five years. Yeah. I apologise if that wasn't clear, council. Yeah, it looked like two elected members. Thank you. Yep. But regardless, so um, those four members would be making decisions for, sorry, the two elected members and the two other meeting committee members yep. would be making decisions, not yes. Okay, Councillor Johnson. Is, is this questions only at this stage or is this up for discussion yet? No, it's only questions at this stage. Oh, wait, then, thanks. Okay. Is there any other questions of Phil? There's not. So on page 155, I'd like to move the recommendations as contained in that report. Um, is there a seconder for those recommendations? Councillor Nixon. So it's been moved and seconded, so it's open for discussion. So I'll go back to Councillor Johnson. Sorry, Vince, you're on mute. Um, yes, I'm totally opposed to this change for delegation authority. Um, you know, there was a specific reason for limiting it to delegation authority to full council. It was to ensure that full council had all the information and the facts on what we still understand and know is a controversial project for our community. Uh, and by having delegation to full council, it meant not just a few members of council could support the project. It also means that by the information coming back to full council, there'll be no surprises. On page 156, it says decisions should be made quickly and reactively. This is precisely why the delegation to full council is necessary. This is the largest project council has tackled and it shouldn't be rushed. There also is a request for the quorum to change to include two elected members. My concern is that we're looking at giving authority to up to quarter of a million. What if um, 
each meeting up to quarter of a million is approved, or each meeting six times quarter million projects are uh, confirmed. Um, you know, this isn't loose change we're talking about, and precisely the reason it was come back to full council is so that this full council could be informed, could keep an eye on spending, and could help with the decision making. The other thing that um, I wanted to say, there was reference, I think, on page 56, 156, which said similar to the financial um, requirements of the Infrastructure Services Committee. Well, the Infrastructure Services Committee consists of all council members. So there's no comparison when you've got on the committee for the civic facility two elected members to make a quorum. That's 20% of the council. These decisions need to come back to full council. And I completely reject and object to changing the delegation. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Nelson. Yeah, my position is I find it frightening that just two elected representatives with the other co committee members, I acknowledge, but two elected members could be making those decisions. And I think it has to go back to full council. I think it's absolutely essential to get a much broader perspective. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nelson, Councillor Holmes, and then Councillor Nixon. David, you're on mute. Sorry, my, after six months, we might find out how it works properly. I am completely opposed to this motion, um, and I think the last two speakers have covered the, my concerns as well. Okay, Councillor Nixon, and then Councillor Peterson, and then Councillor Capel. I suppose my issue is it's an issue of trust. The meeting, the, co the committee meetings are open to anyone. And so all councillors can attend them. And actually, uh, Fraser and I are sitting on a district plan and we're making decisions all the time, um, which you've seen already in terms of the financial contributions. And that's been made by two councillors, basically. Um, so uh, as a, an elected member and your ability to be able to go to a committee and hear and see what's going on, um, and also the push that I've made in terms of making sure that workshops are going to be public. Um, I'm not sure what anyone's really scared of. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Peterson. Yeah, I, I think this is a this is a tricky one. I, I accept what um, Tina is saying, but it it still comes down to the fact that you've just got two elected people making just huge decisions on behalf of the town of the town and the community and the ratepayer and i yeah and i think it just comes back to the fact that that um it, it's it's a nonsense when that a project of this size you've got a council split 50 50. thank you councillor uh, anybody else want to speak oh sorry gary councillor defoe thank you your worship um, yeah, I'm strongly against any change to the terms of reference. This is a $30.8 million project, which has attracted uh, huge public interest and scrutiny. And, and we can't ignore the fact that a very significant percentage of our ratepayer base would like to see this project either paused or stopped completely. Uh, I, I think it's vital that any decision making on a project this big and with such a huge amount of controversy and discussion surrounding it, is seen to truly represent the views of those, not only that sitting around the council table, but the community as a whole. And right now there are wide divisions in both those areas. And these are gonna become even wider if we give what is a committee consisting of just a couple of elected representatives and the mayor, the power to control a large part of the decision-making process. On a project this big and this contentious, we need to display a willingness to be fully accountable with every decision we make. And by accountable, I mean having all elected representatives able to vote on every dollar we spend. And while on the subject of dollars, uh, Your Worship, I, I would like to say, isn't it about time that we admitted that the cost of this project will go way above the 30.8 million we're talking about? that it could go out to 40 million or beyond. I mean, it, it, this, this will happen. I'm sure that we all know that. And finally, I believe that we as selected members 
have to be prepared to meet as often as deemed necessary when projects of this magnitude are on the agenda and at short notice as well. The suggestion that this could be a problem holds no water with me at all. It's simply part of our job. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Johnson, did you have another? Yeah, I just wanted to refute what Councillor Nixon said. I, of course, we understand that we can attend any meetings, but if you're not an appointed member on the committee, you have no influence and can't vote on any discussions or anything that's on the agenda. So it's a moot point. It is far better for the information to be transferred from the Civic Facility Committee back to Council for discussion, deliberation, and for decisions. Okay, Councillor, I'll leave the last word to Councillor Nixon, unless there's somebody else that. I just, I just want to, I just want to remind councillors that there are two, there are going to be two experts on this committee as well. And I've always said right from the outset, as far as I'm concerned, I'd have had this as a totally independent committee anyway, um, because I don't think there's the expertise around the table in terms of big projects. Um, so um, I'm more than happy to rely on two experts, two councillors and a mayor to make damn good decisions. Um, so that's why I'll be supporting this motion. Councillor Mailman. Yeah, I just say I make the point that these re recommendations are about setting up a structure to move forward on decisions that the council have already agreed to. We have agreed to a number of things and this a, having a, a nimble committee to make decisions to progress the, the facility, I believe is important. Um, I, I see that in the paper that the full council will have voting, uh, complete and voting rights and say uh, on the main contract award, which will be significant, and also on the, on the branding of the facility. But in terms of getting things moving, I believe we have to be far more nimble than what we are now. I, I see that this particular uh, civic facility project started back in 2016, and we're down here in 2022, and we haven't progressed it that much at all. Thank you, Councillor Alman. Um, look, I'm going to come, um, Councillor Nelson. Um, just in response to Councillor Mailman's comment, yes, we often make decisions and we made a decision about this very issue fairly recently that it would go to full council. Now we're going against it with this recommendation. Okay, is there anybody else that hasn't spoken that wanted to speak? Uh, yes, Your Worship, sorry. My picture is off because my connection is sadly unstable, so it may actually travel. <laughs> Um, probably a question for um, uh, the CE. The last time we had a project of significance, what was the impact and um, what was the delegations to Whitney Committee uh, outside of uh, a full council? Yes, so the last, last big project of this scale was Homebush, about $30 million again. Now, the full council awarded um, all the major contracts in that, but there was a, um, a subcommittee delegated um, to, 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 um, to give governance over um, the, the um, sort, of, sort of the, the approaches, um, the day-to-day -day issues that came up. They, they all went through um, a, a small committee. That committee consisted, oh, it's a while ago now, um, of the mayor and deputy mayor um, I believe. So um, that was the approach. It, it's, it had delegation around um, um, just answering some of the, the more technical questions, you know, and decisions that a project of that scale has. Um, all the major, but the contracts were all handled with for the full contract, for the full council. So. Okay. And, okay. Is that fine, Councillor Gear? Okay. Um, Councillor Defoe? Uh, You're on mute. Uh, Your Worship, I'd just like to say to, to, to David's reply there that having been on council when that home bush was going through, and I'm sure David Holmes would agree with me, the acrimony uh, was not exactly strong around the council table then, and I think that if we look back, 
we might have uh, got a lot further uh, and, and, and made a lot better decisions on that particular project had we had the whole council involved with everything there as well. Thank you. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. It's been, discuss it's been discussed, I will just say a few words. So councillors have had the opportunity to be part of this um, civic centre committee. Some have chosen to step away and not be part of it. So to me, the delegations, this is uh, a committee that was already, a, that had been established, that has the, the role to, pro, if you like, at a governance level, have oversight over this project. I'm not so um, hung up about the appointment of contracts because most of those contracts with very, very few exceptions couldn't can be done within the delegation already given to the chief exec. The main contract has to come back to council. My main um, concern or not concern is, but is being part as ex officio on this committee is the oversight, the government's oversight on it. So I think we can get hung up about contracts and dollars. I think as Councillor Nixon has already stated, all of you that are not that are members of this committee will receive the agendas as you do for any committee, even if you're a member or not, you are welcome to attend the meetings. So I just, I think the, the concerns are, are not justified. So the recommendations are there on page 155. I've moved them, it's been seconded by Councillor Nixon. So I'm now going to put the motion. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your right hand. Those against. Okay, the um, motion is carried. Thank you. Moving on now to the next item on page one six. Excuse um, me, you wish it. Can I have my um, vote recorded, name recorded against that, please? Okay, and is that why you've got your hand up, Tim? Yeah, and also, can I, I can't see, can I please have the names of the people who voted for it? So you will, okay, yep. So that would be the, um, yeah, Harry, do you want to call a division? Do we need to call a division? Harriet, then. Yeah, sorry, you still need to call a division, um, Mayor. Okay, so I'll call, it, call a division. All those that um, have voted for the motion, please raise your right hand. Put your hand down, Tim. So that you can see those, Harriet. So that's uh, Mayor, I have, um, Mayor um, Lynn Patterson, Councillor Fraser Mailman, Councillor Sandy Ryan, Councillor Graham McClymont, Councillor Tina Nixon, and Councillor Brent um, Gear. Yeah, that's correct. Those against, please mm -hmm. raise your right hand. Okay, you have those. Uh, would, you read, would you like me to read those out? Yes, please. Um, Councillor Chris Peterson, Councillor David Holmes, Councillor Beth Johnson, Councillor Gary Caffell, and Councillor Tim Nelson. Okay, thank you. Could I have my vote recorded too, please, Lynn? Yeah, please record my vote, and I hope people notice um, the change of vote from a particular councillor. Thank you. So can I just say that when we call a division, those votes are recorded in the minutes. So we don't need to say, um, that, so the division is called and those for and those against are noted in the minutes. I, I take issue with that. that. That's a really terrible thing to do, to do, to point out someone who's changed their vote. Um, I noticed that a certain uh, Councillor Nielsen was very keen to point out supposed tone um, of some of my um, cordial a few weeks ago, 
Um, but I, I think that is a very nasty. Um, okay. it's, let's cut it. Let's move not, on. That is not good. Nasty. I'm going to call for a point of order, please, Councillor Nelson. No response. We're moving on to the next item. Okay. Page 163. I, um, item number 14, Road and Procurement Strategy 2022 to 2025. Uh, this is quite a comprehensive document. Um, so there has been some changes. Um, it's needed to be reviewed every three years. Is Kane or you, who's um, taking? Uh, I think, Matt, can you um, just run through the, the detail and Kane is available for questions? Right. Yep, yep. Um, so as as the Mayor has explained, as um, part of the Waka Kotahi um, process, we have to update our transport, um, our road and procurement strategy every three years. And these updates um, essentially are made to reflect any changes to Waka Kotahi's um, road and procurement approach and also their wider road and approaches. And also it is an opportunity for us to ensure that our strategy fits in with our wider procurement work. So um, Kane and myself have undertaken this task to update our strategy. There haven't been major um, changes to the strategy. Um, the key things are basically just reflecting the updates to the government's approach to, to procurement as a whole and also Waka Kotahi's approach with an um, increased focus on safety as part of their roading strategy. Um, yeah, so those are those are sort of the key highlights. Um, the process from here, if council was to endorse the strategy, it would then go to Waka Kotahi for consideration, um, consideration and any updates that they see need to be made, and then it is endorsed by Waka Kotahi and is in place for three years, and then it is reviewed at the end of that period. Thank you, thank you, Matt, and yes, I see on. The page 172, those same um, five principles of government procurement and feeding through into this road and um, strategy, uh, procurement strategy as well. Okay then, so is there any, um, Councillor Nelson, I see you've still got your hand up, but uh, is there any questions uh, of Matt on this uh, item? There it is not, so I'm, the recommendation is there on page 163 that council approves the revised rating procurement strategy provided as attached to the report. I'm happy to move that. Is there a second there? <coughs> Councillor McClellan, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councillor Holmes? Yes, I've got several questions here. Um, it's basically about the contract. Um, I see the contracts for the duration of five years and with a maximum of eight years, depending on performance. Now, can I just what, ask just what page you're on, please? Just by the council. Oh, I haven't got, it's well through. I've just made some notes here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's on performance. And um, at what stage can the council terminate a contract? Now, one of my concerns is that we, um, and I know in 2019, Southwire, Apple and Carter decided to go together. We've got two major suppliers of, of product here. We've got Higgins and Fulton Hogan. Um, at what stage can the council terminate a contract? Because one of my que queries is that the inferior uh, road ceiling that's happened throughout the whole district, and that's only one, one example, can, uh, you know, I'd just like to know the criteria of, of, about performance, if Matt or David could answer that. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, we've got quite a, um, a complicated KPI process that our, our contractors are assisting against, which goes into um, the contract. Kane, I'm, I might have to rely on you, if you can join us, to help answer David's Question, um, sorry, Councillor Holmes's question um, regarding um, performance and our ability to, to make sure that we get that delivered. So, Councillor, um, um, just referring to the maintenance contract only, it's the, um, 
it's the contracts over a million dollars that we generally apply a performance framework to, and it follows the NZTA or Walker Kota email um, PACE, um, which is a performance assessment system, and it has a number of areas which you rate on a quarterly basis your contract is performance against. Excuse me, Kane, you're a little bit hard to hear, so I don't know whether you need to come closer. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, did, did you catch that though, or do I need to repeat yeah, no, that again? I think I've got my head around that, yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's, and it's done on a quarterly basis, um, and, and then an annual sort of sum up of those quarterly performance reports are, are brought together. Um, we've also got, a in the maintenance contract, we've got a performance um, KPI system that's linked to a monetary uh, amount of money too, which um, is either paid in full or or reduced depending on which things aren't aren't achieved in that in that month um, through audits and and inspections. So um, there's a couple of uh, performance systems undergoing there. In terms of terminating a contract, that's that's that that's quite um, uh, that's a process in, under um, under the under the contract we're oper operating under the standard um, NZ uh, nine one six style contract we were operating under for a maintenance term service contract. So we would need to follow all the um, due process in that uh, and have everything um, lined up to, to do that. So um, there would be um, there would be a lot of um, negotiation in the hearings before you got to the point of terminating it. Yeah, I just sort of get the feeling that there's a change of um, we've lost a lot of the old heads around the district now with our roading. And um, I was talking to just farmers I've spoken to around the area. The We're only in February and the country's on the move. Um, there's going to be, if we get the big storm that the Ken Rings predicted next month, we could have a huge situation arising for this winter. And um, you know, the roading, the roading really does concern me because we haven't got a lot of money in our emergency fund and it may be needed. So I'm just, um, no one, no, no doubt Alec Birch has talked to you about it, but we're potentially facing a very wet winter and it could be quite disastrous yep. for us. And I have to put out a, a big, um, uh, our contract has worked extremely hard and, and well during, during the event and in terms of performance and their, and their outputs. During the response and and cleanup, I've got no no concerns at all. No, um, I'm 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 not worried about. Oh, I think the perform Higgins were out very quickly getting road. Okay. road um, Councillor, can I suggest yep. Yep. we come I back will. to the agenda item, please, which is on the okay. Table, yep. Uh, you've, the you've, answered, you've answered the question. I'm just worried about the future. Okay, Councillor. Thank Ryan. you. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a sore throat. Yeah, Kane, I, I get that this um, review is strategies about infrastructure and you know, laying roads and street lighting, etc. But the table 3.1 on page um, 178, part of it refers to obviously the low cost, low risk, and it talks about the road to zero. I just absolutely struggle with how we participate in delivering that strategy program. In terms of, you know, I know it's part of the safety program, but it just doesn't seem achievable to me. Okay, so the, the road to zero program is, is a new is a new item that the government's um, put money aside to, and um, we've got within this three year um, NLT funding uh, a number of projects that have been approved. Uh, this year's projects you'll see are, are Colombo Road Route Safety Improvements and um, the roundabout we finished. So those are the types of improvement projects that get funded through that. That stream of project, that 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 category, road to zero. Um, speed manager is another one. So anything to do with speed management, reducing speeds, a, a road to zero uh, improvement for our district. But you're right. Um, there are um, challenging, um, uh, big big projects that um, could pro probably make a difference that we we don't really have the funding and budget to to get to get to. I guess. It's almost like it needs rebranding with another name. Good luck. Well, it's not it's not zero. It's a, it's actually a it's actually a reduction of thirty percent over over a decade, I think. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've got not a lot to do with um, the Ministry of Transport or Rocket Tahi's policy. Um, 
We're all part of the picture, though, I think. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, kia ora, councillors. Uh, I will speak to the report rather than um, leave it as, as read. So um, I'll try and um, summarise what we've got in the report, where we've got to. Um, the council is being asked to uh, not consult on the annual plan for year two of our LTP um, years the 21 to 31 LTP. Um, and, and, the, and the basis of that um, recommendation is that there are no significant changes to year two's budgets um, and issues to be consulted on um, in an annual plan consultation process. Um, the current um, budget that we have um, identified in terms of uh, line item detail changes from um, the LTP numbers um, works through to a, a number of 6.9% increase in rates required. So we've got a, a $56 million operating expenditure budget and $38.4 million of rates required to, to fund um, that budget. Um, the balance being from user pays, user charges, and other income. So the, the increase in the rates we need to fund um, is where we arrive back to in, in um, the bottom line for our budgets and the bottom line for the impact on uh, the rate payers who are funding the, the organisation. Um, and that 6.9% increase, that, that, um, that is an average um, number, but it will be close to that for both urban and rural as the, uh, the, 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 the types of costs are, are spread fairly evenly across the district where the impacts are. Um, there's no legal requirement to consult on an annual plan given there's no significant material differences identified in year two. Um, so every three years we, we consult, we, we ran a, a full consultation for our long-term plan uh, we undertook reviews of service levels and the council adopted the service levels um, in the long-term plan process. So um, in the, the year we're going into now, we're not proposing and the council is not proposing to change any service levels. Um, to, to reduce and cut budgets would mean reducing service levels. So. At, at this stage, the council is not proposing to reduce any services and therefore not reduce any budgets to pay for those services. Um, the, there are some items in the budget that won't be completed in the current year that we're expected to be largely capital items. We won't spend as much on some of those capital items and we'll roll them into next year and therefore the, the year two um, capital budget will reflect um, increased amounts to complete projects um, in those years. And the, the animal shelter redevelopment is one of those. The airport work um, is another one. Uh, the civic facility is another one where um, the expectation is that um, 
the full level of expenditure that we allowed for in year one um, won't be incurred and we need to roll it into year two. Um, and some property renewals as well. So there, there are changes, but they're, they're not significant changes and they're in the capital program, which has very little impact on rates because the capital program is either funded by loans or by reserves. Um, I mentioned the levels of service that we've um, um, had agreement from, from the council. Um, the 5.6% that was allowed for in year two of the LTP included some um, increases for inflation. Uh, inflation is now higher than what we allowed for in that year two of the LTP. We allowed 1.5%. Um, it's 2.8 has been built into our budgets, but we're well aware now that the inflationary environment we're in is um, is the 2.8 percent will be probably short of um, what we need to build in to um, allow budgets to to um, keep the council services operating. Um, so we 5.6 percent was what was in the long term plan year two. Um, the increase to 6.9, part of that is because we need to allow for more inflation on our operating costs. Uh, the other area that has required um, increased expenditure is water, and that was allowed for in the, in the LTP year two budget. We have installed water meters, um, and those water meters um, have been loan funded and they're depreciating now, they are incurring interest costs. Um, we've also purchased land um, as a, a resilience exercise to um, increase water storage at the water treatment plant at Kaituna. That's incurring extra interest, um, debt servicing costs next year. Um, so the, the cost of the urban water supply um, has increased um, from year one to year two. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're facing a rates increase. Um, other increases in expenditure in the year two budget included stormwater um, provisions and a wastewater increasing the, the level of um, investigation into infiltration into the stormwater network. Um, so the, the uh, year two budgets um, contain um, what we allowed for in the LTP. Um, I think that's probably the, I've covered most things, uh, fees and charges, thanks. Um, we have allowed for increases in fees and charges where um, they are impacting, uh, inflation is impacting on the, on the cost of the services. So um, health licensing um, fees for, for food premises, building consent fees, planning consent fees, um, they will increase by the rate of inflation. Similarly, um, uh, solid waste, uh, we have increases in uh, inflation from the, the trucking freight to Bonnie Glen. Uh, Bonnie Glen charges will go up and there's another $10 uh, waste levy to be added next year as well. Uh, so, so fees and charges um, have been allowed for to go up. Uh, so it's not just uh, rate increases to, um, that are covering the cost of our increasing costs. Uh, I'll hand over to Karen to talk about the, the consultation and the, the options um, around how we um, disseminate the information about the annual plan. Oh, thank you, David, and Kia ora koutou. Uh, so David's covered off some of the aspects around the consultation and the, the requirement or the lack of a requirement under the Local Government Act to actually consult on the annual plan because um, there are no significant or material differences. There's a whole host of requirements under the Act where we do have significant and material differences as to what's required by consultation, uh, the purpose of the detail of the consultation document, those don't apply um, in these circumstances. Um, taking on to page 203, we've identified there are reasons why we do not consider 
um, that any of the changes are significant or material. I think that's really important to note and to spell out so that we can understand that. Um, and effectively, our work programme is basically what we said that we were going to be doing um, in year two. Um, and as David's mentioned, we're not proposing any changes to the levels of service. Importantly, the rates increase to 6.9 is less than that limit that we have set in our financial strategy of 7.3%. And the fees and charges, again, are not significant uh, to, to warrant the consultation. Um, and, um, and we've identified by looking at our council's significance and engagement policy, which of course we're required to have, um, that none of those changes and those variances are significant. So some practical considerations as well that support that uh, the, the, the legal drivers. Um, really, there is a limited ability for the community to, to influence the drivers. The significant drivers of the, of the rates increase are around inflation. Um, and when we talk about consulting, we want to get the community's views um, in order to be able to input into our decision making. Um, if there's nothing we can do about certain factors, then there's nothing that we can do to change that decision making around those rates increases due to inflation. So it feels a bit of an empty consultation if we're asking people, um, effectively we're raising an expectation there that, that doesn't really exist. Um, we've also at this point not identified any other viable options to the proposed programme and the associated budget that's been identified. Um, we, we're not required, uh, as I say, because there are, the material, there are no significant or material differences. So we're not bound by those requirements of the Local Government Act around what goes into the consultation document. But we are bound by other provisions, and those are notably around the decision making. Again, what's the point of asking for the community's views here? It's so that we can be informed, you can be informed as councillors, and have input into that decision making process. We can't simply go out with a what do you think to this because that we're going to get a whole host of responses back to that. Um, the requirements in the Act around decision making and indeed our own significance and engagement policy requires that the consultation has to be more directive than that. We have to provide the community with sufficient information and sufficient alternatives to what we've proposed to be able to make an informed decision and informed choice and give their views back to, to council. So that's why we talk about we have to have either options identified, what the costs of particular options are, and the benefits and the disadvantages of those options. We're bound by the Act there, but it also makes good sense, doesn't it? We don't want to have an empty consultation that also raises expectations that we can't deliver on. So we would need to formulate some viable options um, as alternatives to the proposed budget and the programme of work that we have. And up to now, we haven't done that. Um, moving on, there are, of course, financial costs and risks associated with consultation. Um, there's always costs we've identified. We um, did some work for the long term plan um, a couple of years ago on what potential costs there would be in just simply in officer time. Um, and we would we costed this out as around about 35 to 50,000 dollars, depending on um, if we take a low or a high uh, idea and depending on how much we would charge ourselves out for. Um, and of course, you know, those, those costs, we're already here. This is for, 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 for officers' time. We're already here, so those costs would be incurred. Um, but we also have promotional costs to add on top of that. Um, because we're already here, unfortunately, the opportunity costs of officers then not being able to undertake other work are really quite significant, um, particularly at this time. You know that we have a long term plan amendment out at the moment. Um, we also have the election starting. We've just started our work, our project work around that. And the same officers are involved in these pieces of work, our finance people and our comms people. We're all the same officers involved. So unless we get an additional resource to be able to help us with this consultation, there are those costs that are associated and they're not insignificant. So we need to weigh that up with the benefits of consultation. Moved on to some of the risks, so I won't go through those. There are the usual risks that have resulted in, in um, consultation that uh, um, we feel may not be necessary or we don't, or may be rushed. Um, and so we have legal and reputational risks and there's a lot of potentially a lack of trust in the community for any further work that we have. And as David mentioned, we carry out a lot of, of consultation on the long-term plan. It was only a year ago. Um, it was quite significant. A 
And people told us what they thought that their priorities were. And that's what we've built into our long-term plan. And as we're running on the basis of this, we're not deviating from what we said that we're going to be doing in year two. So we can all already say to a certain extent that we know what the community's views are there. And we have previously not consulted on the annual plan. So those are the reasons, just laying out and just being clear why officers consider um, that consultation is not necessary on the annual plan itself, just to be clear, on the proposed budget and the proposed programme of work, which is in that annual plan. What we do think is really important, particularly because all of the measures and all of the um, impacts uh, of uh, external influences that, uh, that David's gone through, is that we really do need to go out and tell the community about this and explain why we're looking at a 6.9 um, proposed increase and just being clear that it's proposed at this time and that's subject to change of course as we as we work um, um, our way through the planning process. So we're thinking that we would like to have a good um, engagement campaign and inform campaign and so that we can explain um, this, that we can answer questions around what's in the proposed plan of work um, and really getting that to the community there um, and just reminding the community of other options that they have to provide, the, provide us with their views. We've also identified some other areas that we think that we really can benefit from engagement, um, perhaps not at this time, but a little bit later in the year. We know that we, um, we have um, uh, an opportunity to start thinking about the new council coming in and uh, looking back at our strategic direction in the long term plan. We haven't had a look at that for a while. And so, you know, checking in with the community around um, are we still heading in the right direction? Are our priorities still the priorities that the community has? Um, uh, and also informing that for we've got to do some preliminary work on our environmental scan there. So, so getting the community's input into that, are we tracking along how you want us to track on? We've also got a whole host of consultations. Um, we've outlined those in, in the, uh, the appendix. So there's lots of opportunity for people to provide input into our decision making and our policy development um, uh, across a wide range of functions that we, that we have. Um, so it's not that we don't have an opportunity to communicate, we really do. Um, and we would um, be very, very, very um, happy for councillors, of course, to, to um, throw their weight around uh, uh, behind the, um, all of the consultation measures that we have planned coming up. So that's probably all I need to say um, on the consultation, but I think we're okay. happy to move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David and Karen. So is there any questions? Um, on the report to, or to staff regarding what's um, just been stated. Uh, Councillor Nelson Thank and you. then Councillor Lyons. Just a question for David Paris. Hey David, what would be um, the equivalent of a 1% reduction in rates in terms of actual money? What would that be, round figures? 1% uh, would be 350000 so $350,000 less spending would be a 1% reduction in rates. Uh, yes, it could be less spending. It could be more use of charges, okay. um, uh, more, more targeted charges for, for people using services, um, which reduces the rates input. Thank you. Councillor Holmes. I have a question for David Paris. Um, I just wondered, David, with the timing of the airport runway extension and purchase of, of property, um, I just wonder with the sale of the, some land around um, at, at the airport just lately, if the per metre price is going to get too high, I just wonder if, if, if that is going to proceed. And I realise it's stage two. Um, are you still going to go ahead with it at this stage? Yeah, says here you are. Well, I'm, I'm just, just going to uh, check and seek on that, I think. Yes. So, so we're proceeding with the, the um, stage um, one and the PGF funding. So the provisions are in the budget for that work and they've been um, accounted for. So okay. it's, a, it's about delivering what we've, we've consulted on. Yeah. Okay. We'll, have, we'll be having a, a, a discussion about the airport at some other stage, will we, before then? Um, uh, we've got some decisions to come up with some contracts. So, yes, there will be some contracts coming to council, um, especially around the runway widening. So, yes, there yep. will be some more discussions coming. 
Yeah, so we can entail that extension into that. Thank you. Okay, is there any other questions for clarity? No, so the recommendations are there on page 198. So um, I'm quite happy to move those. Is there a seconder for the recommendations? Councillor McClymore. So it's been moved and seconded and now open for discussion. Is there any discussion? Councillor Capel. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I'm I'm strongly of the belief that council should have formal consultation on this on the annual plan. Uh, the projected rates increase of six point nine percent cannot be seen as some sort of good news story. Certainly, there is no time to be congratulating ourselves on what's still going to be a very hefty financial burden for many of our ratepayers both in the urban and rural areas. And that, that increase will go up considerably from 6.9% for some of those people, we know that. It's for that very reason that I think it would be totally improper not to allow the very people who elected us as their representatives, the opportunity to suggest what savings might be made to reduce the rates increase being projected today. Uh, who knows, they might well come up with suggestions which we fail to entertain. I think we have to give them that chance. Uh, we only have to look at our two major projects, the Civic Centre and Hood Airdrome, for evidence of how much the landscape has changed in the last 12 months. What the public was being told 12 months ago in some cases in those projects is a hell of a lot different from what they're being told now. Uh, I, for one, would, would love to know what the public think of the proposed siting of the Civic Centre and all that goes with it, and whether they think that the expense of lengthening the runway at Hood Edrome is, is, is a good move. And finally, could I just say, Lynn, that the, the part of the recommendation which talks about undertaking engagement on the 22-23 annual plan is quite frankly a joke to me. What we are saying to people is, look, we have made our decisions, these are the reasons why, and no matter what you think, no matter what you think, we're not going to change our minds. How the hell anybody could see that as a positive form of consultation is just beyond comprehension to me. Our ratepayers aren't that gullible. I just don't believe they're that gullible. So I, I certainly am in favour of public consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Johnson. Um, I'll echo Councillor Caffell's comments. I'm opposed to the recommendation not to consult with our community. I appreciate that many of the increases are due to external drivers, but we can certainly investigate some internal drivers to make changes. One of them is staffing salaries. Our personnel costs are increasing by a million dollars. Whilst I acknowledge it's fair to meet the market on pay ex ex expectations, we shouldn't be adding positions. In this plan, there's call for more staffing and communications. What is the return on this investment to our ratepayers? We had a fully funded new digital position at the library. The funding has finished, so should the position. Surely when a new job is considered or created, others must be reviewed. We just can't keep adding to our staff capacity and costs. It also states in the paper that one of the reasons for increases is COVID. Shouldn't COVID also be a reason why we should pull back on our spending? On page 199, it states that the annual plan process provides an opportunity to review intended work programs. As Gary said, two of our biggest upcoming expenses are the civic facility and hood projects. Is now in the COVID era the time to spend that much money, it's actually time to say no, I believe. With regards to Hood, everyone I've spoken to supports and celebrates stage one of the development. That's the upgrade of infrastructure and the widening of the runway. But I'm yet to meet a stakeholder or user group that supports stage two, which is the lengthening of the runway, the diversion of Manaya Road and using the Public Works Act to secure private property. And stage two, the council's commitment is up to 5 million. We should say no. Together, these two projects could save as much as 2% on our rates increase moving forward. We can certainly review our program of works, which it says that's what the annual plan's for, and this should be consulted with our residents and ratepayers. 
Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nelson. You're on mute, Tom. Apologies. I oppose this recommendation. Um, let's give our community the opportunity to provide feedback and let's do it in a way that's done in a well-organized way. The last time we did consultation for the long-term plan was appalling. That was raised at the very beginning of the process. So the feedback that we got wasn't what it should have been. And that was raised at the beginning and throughout the process. I find the, um, on page 206 of disadvantages to be a little bit patronizing for our ratepayers. Risk of confusion with the upcoming consultation on the long-term plan amendments to progress um, housing on the Panama land. I'm sure our ratepayers on a well-organized consultation process will recognize the difference there. And also um, the risk of consultation fatigue given the range of consultation that is scheduled for the coming year. I think our ratepayers would appreciate the opportunity to give feedback on this. And when I do hear, um, probably echoing Councillor Johnson's thoughts, the ways in which uh, we could reduce the um, amount being spent, $350,000 doesn't seem to be that much money to find in regards to perhaps a 1% reduction in rates. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any other uh, discussion? Uh, Councillor Malman? And then Councillor Peterson. Fraser, you're on mute. I still haven't learned to put it my yellow, yellow hand up. Some someone may be able to teach me that shortly. But um, yeah, I, I uh, support the staff's recommendation, but because of the the fact that the level of services hasn't changed from what we consulted on last year, but to do so in saying that we can consult in different ways, and I think we can. We it's a very important that we engage those groups that that um, that have a voice for a number of people. And we also tell the story about the reasons for the increase. There's the groups I'm talking about are, are, are people like the Masters and District Rate Payers, MAGS, Riversdale and uh, Castle Point um, communities and residents get the opportunity to have their say. But it doesn't have to go in terms of a formal consultation. It can be a different way of engaging. And I, so in that respect, I, I support where the staff are coming from. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Peterson. Yeah, I, I guess I'm really encouraged by what um, uh, Councillor Mailman's just said. You know, I, I think um, it, it may well be that our opportunities uh, are now are limited considering this is year two of a long-term plan and and our, our long-term plan decisions have have curtailed our the our ability to to um, respond uh, far outside the, the, of what we what what has already been decided. But um, I just think that, that that engagement is just so important. And on page two hundred and seven of the it says, you know, there needs to be an opportunity to remind our community that conversations are ongoing and not limited to our corporate planning cycles. So this is very much deal, dealing with the corporate planning cycles, the, the agenda item here, but but we need to, to look at, at other ways we can um, build relationships with elements in our community, because that's the only way that um, councils are going to remain relevant. We 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 tut tut about the, the voting turnout and we um, and we know that there is a significant level of um, um, uh, disquiet or, or, or a lot of people see councils as being somewhat irrelevant to them. And so we need to build up those relationships and communication lines. And maybe that's, and that's going to take some resources too. It, it, we can't do that on the cheap. So, so a lot of, a lot of my comment on, on, today's agenda item is that you know um, um, for sure engagement is 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 important but it it really also uh, requires um, requires resourcing thank you uh, councillor peterson councillor Nixon. and then councillor ryan 
Yeah, um, I to 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 um, what Fraser is saying in respect of the um, levels of service. If we're not altering them, then there is no legal requirement for us to consult. Um, the other issue that Bex has raised is the issues of staffing, and I think this one on the face of it always looks like an easy sacrificial cow. But the problem that I have with being too general around this is that it looks like we're just um, growing staff for no real reason. And the real reason is that we've got too many unfunded mandates from central government. So we should actually should be pushing back on central government to stop asking us to deliver services without the money that follows and the staff. Um, so um, from that perspective, I don't actually think we've got a problem with the growth of our staff. And the market is is so, and it's the market is also being pushed up by central government. So we're having to pay more because of central government. Um, so um, from that perspective, I, I I don't think there's a really good valid, valid argument around. Let's have a look at staffing. And the other issue is, is a, and, and it doesn't seem to be in this document, um, and I think it needs to be clearer, is the, is the rate of growth. Since 2015, we've increased our population by nearly 3,000 people. That is a village the size of Featherston. So that costs, it simply costs. And as Fraser and, and, and I can sit down and tell you at any time, at the moment, we don't have the right instruments in the right places to be able to make the differences as to how we can charge for that growth. So that makes life really difficult for our staff at the moment because they can't pull a lot of levers um, as well. So that's what makes the district plan so important in, in this. Um, so from my perspective, I'll be supporting the motion. I don't think we should be, we, we um, need to um, consult, but I really like the idea of actually going out to some of those who are, the, are highly critical and saying to them, okay, what can we do? Um, and maybe we'll get to a better shared understanding at the end of it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ryan. Thank you, Worship. I agree with uh, both Councillor Marwin and Nixon. I also, um, you know, we now have a full, con a full team of community development activators. They are very, I mean, I've been approached by them. They're very keen to get out and be in the community and hearing the voice. I think we utilise some of the resources that we now have built up. We've got a very good comms team. It's about telling the story and, and enabling people to come back and provide feedback. Um, we've got an incredibly good library staff who are constantly interacting with our community. And also there's us as elected members. You know, there's enough, you know, we can be having forums to get give information and give feedback. And so I, I do support the recommendation. I don't think it has to be a very expensive formal process. I think we can utilise the resources that we already have in existence. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Holmes and then um, Councillor McClellan. Just briefly, I wondered if we could change in the recommendation, if we could just change the wording in number D somewhat, just to, to make it clearer. That was just a thought that I had. Thank you. What's your suggestion around it, Councillor Holmes? Yeah, well, I, I've got to be honest, a Fraser's idea I, I, I quite like, but I just think we need to just tighten it up a little bit. Um, I don't think, I think the uh, wording could be made by someone much better at words than I am. So can I just leave it for a couple of minutes while the people the converse, enjoy the conversation and, and perhaps Harriet or something could work something out. That's right. I've got um, Karen in that uh, right here beside me, so maybe she can think to strengthen the words around undertake engagement, um, yep. incorporating some of the comments that Councillor Melman made. Okay. Um, I see Chris and Sandy still have a hand up, but it's Graham to talk, uh, Graham next. Councillor McClellan. Unmute, please. Oh, you did. Graham. Yeah. And then oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's probably very confusing for anyone watching in on this, but it all does come back to these levels of service. And we've just all got to remember we all had workshops last year and we agreed on the level of services. So the flow through is the rate increase, which is driven by different factors, but mainly around inflation. So for the public watching this, you know, councillors have to address the level of service a year or two out from where we set these rates. So, and the one about staffing, I mean, yes, you have to watch staffing, 
But you, if you haven't got in-house staff, you have to buy in resource. And 100% Tina's knocked it, hit right on the head here. We are just getting loaded up with more and more compliance and responsibilities all the time. You know, the drinking water spans, everything is just increasing. The building, the liquefaction reports for building, it's, it's coming from central government and it's unfunded. So just sort of backing up everything that's pretty much been said. But we haven't got any choice now. We're, we've, we're too close. We can't get out for consultation we're, and do a, a plausible job. So that's all I've got to add. Thank you, Graham. Is there any other um, discussion? I think most people have had their say. Um, have we had any thought about strengthening? Just can Fraser uh, re paraphrase what he said? Just Fraser, <laughs> would you like to, to um, paraphrase a little bit of what you said so that we can try and incorporate it under D? I think you talked about building relationships. Oh, no, that was across about building relationships going out and talking directly to groups like um, the Riversdale and all the residents and rate Players association. Can you add anything more to it? Ren's got his hand up too. Oh, Ren. sorry. Fraser, I might leave it with you to have a look at um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm playing around with the mute button and I still haven't found how to put my hand up. But uh, in, confirms council will not consult but will undertake, engage, undertake engagements with uh, key, um, key, key groups within the community and also provide the opportunity uh, for the public to place comment on the levels of service or something like that. Okay, I'll leave that with staff to have a quick look at, and I'll go to Brent. Apologies, Brent, that I, did, I missed you out. Sorry. No, that's right. That's my unstable internet. Um, yeah, look, I think formal consultation in this instance isn't required. There's a difference between consultation and conversation. Conversations can happen 12 months of the year. It doesn't need to be for a fixed period of time. And I would hate to think that our ratepayers uh, can't actually talk to council outside of a consultation period. Now, um, I am all for consultation. I think it is a vital part of what we do, but I am objecting to paying out extra money uh, between 35 and 50K, if not more for external help, to consult on a document where nothing has changed. So um, I do believe engaging the likes of Marston residents and ratepayers, uh, Castle Point, Riversdale, and any other interested party to come and talk to councillors. Uh, there's no reason we can't set up meetings uh, without it being a formal consultation and cost a fortune for um, for people to make themselves available to uh, to talk to the public. So I, for one, will be supporting the motion. Okay, thank you, councillor. Um, councillor Peterson, did you have something else to add? Yeah, yeah so I, I just wondered with this um, uh, wordsmithing that in D, whether it would be sufficient just to add um, but we'll undertake engagement um, to build stronger relationships with our community um, would be all that's needed and to cut. Councillors, how does that um, uh, Councillor Hines, does that cut it? If we just say undertake engagement to build stronger relationships, um, maybe with key groups in our community. Um, yeah, and I'm not too sure. It's, it's complicated, yeah. I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy with that, but I'm sure there's some wording could be improved. Okay, Karen. Um, my initial response is that our oh, significance and engagement policy will um, certainly um, direct us to this type of consultation and engagement that you're that we're talking about here. Um, it's very clear in our policy around uh, what circumstances and what groups, if we're carrying out targeted uh, engagement um, and and broad and more broad engagement, and we will be putting together a, 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 an engagement plan, of course, um, for that. So. So 
um, if you feel confident to, to leave it to officers uh, in, um, in, in taking that work forward, we, we could just leave the resolution as it is. Um, if you prefer something tidied up and just being more specific, we could perhaps add another one before, in between D and E around um, engagement should be broad and targeted with key target groups. Um, with the intention also of receiving feedback on levels of service to inform the next LTP. Um, well, that's kind of key points that I, that I picked up from yourselves. So there's two options there. I think that's quite a good option, the latter one, that we leave D as it is, and then we add um, um, another one after D, which will be yes. the new e. I'd be happy with that, Lynn. Okay. Do you just want to read what the E will... Um, E now, the current E becomes an F, and if we will add in another E, can you read that uh, again, Karen? Um, this was just off the top of my head, so please feel free to wordsmith. Um, <clears throat> engagement would be both broad and targeted with key target groups, um, and with a view to receiving feedback on levels of service to inform the next long term plan. Okay, does, does that, you're comfortable with that, Councillor Hines? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I think most. Is there anybody else that had their hand up that hasn't spoken that wants to speak? No. Okay. So it's. I'm quite happy. I moved it, and um, Councillor McClomont seconded it. So you're happy with those changes, Councillor McClomont? Yes, he's waving to me. Um, so I, I think. Having sat through a lot of previous annual plan consultations before the legislation changed, I think this is a really good way to get out in our community through a more informed process. Um, so, I mean, I've obviously moved the recommendation. I also think we've got to be careful when we say we're going for those that may want to have gone out to formal consultation. We can't go out um, or shouldn't need to go out given our LTP was only approved nine months ago. Um, and we had did a lot of consultation at that time. And also, I think has been previously stated, what's changed in that time? So uh, the Local Government Act with those changes recognised that you really shouldn't need to go out in your annual plan process if you've done your LTP and determined your level of services and services that you'll provide. So I, I, I just, um, on that note, I'm going to put the recommendation on page 198. Can I just, and, say, can I just say something, please, Your Worship? No, I've, um, that's my right of reply is moving. So no, I won't allow. Moving, I'm going to, um, Put the recommendation on page 198, A to F, and with the new E, which I'll get Karen to read out once more. Um, that engagement is both broad and targeted uh, with key target groups uh, with a view to receiving feedback on levels of service to inform the next LTP. Okay, so uh, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Of the recommendation, please recommendations, please raise your right hand. Okay, thank you. Those against? Okay, the motion is passed. Okay, moving on now to page 210 on Berlin Park Playground up, um, update. This is uh, Corin. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, so just a, a paper for uh, information for the council, because I know there um, has been keen interest in, in uh, Burling Park and the work we're doing to um, re replace equipment there. Um, so uh, we had a very successful uh, engagement event uh, in partnership with the Lansdowne Residents Association on the 28th of November. Um, and uh, that uh, put a series of options uh, to, to the community uh, and people who attended. And um, uh, we just wanted to update the council to let them know that uh, uh, out of that, we've actually, we had 
two really strong contenders that came out of it, and that was a double flying fox, so that would replace the flying fox that was there before, but also um, a fort um, uh, type structure as well, with a with a or a climbing tower with a basket swing. Um, so we're going to move forward with um, putting those into the into the playground. Um, we'll go out and communicate with the community and let people know what's starting to happen. But we obviously wanted to uh, let council know um, first uh, that that's where we're at. Thank you, uh, Corin. So, have councillors got any questions? Tina, I see your hand up. Is that from the last, or you want to speak to this one? No, I'm a bit like Fraser. Sometimes I forget a hand up to work it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Ryan. Uh, yeah, Corin, um, uh, you know, I was with you when you were doing the consultation, which was done so professionally, but I do recall there was a lot of um, feedback to you and your staff uh, around a toilet, a public toilet, mm -hmm. because particularly from the uh, preschools who use that as their only green space for their preschool ripper rugby and their picnics and other things but I see in your report there's no mention of a public toilet um yep yeah, so um so that the public toilet but hasn't been lost Sandy we're just um in this dealing with the playground equipment itself um we do need to do a bit more work around things like a, a public toilet etc but that hasn't been lost in terms of the feedback from the community um so um we'll absolutely keep that in the conversation Okay, is there any other questions of Corin? Okay, so the report is there with the recommendations on page 210 that we note the community engagement and that we note that work has been undertaken to progress um, the upgrade and installation. So this report is for information, so I'm happy to move there. Um, was it a, did you want to second it, Gary? Uh, can yes. I look at that? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's been moved and seconded. So if there's no further discussion, I'll um, put that uh, for information. All those in favour, please raise your right hand. Again, the motion is carried. Moving on now to the next report. Did, did councillors want a break or are you all okay? You must be all okay because nobody's saying uh, they want a break. Okay, moving on now to page 213, which is the elections update. Uh, so, Karen, this is um, your report, uh, which just details who's going to be the electoral officer, etc. So, it's for information as well. Is there any, did you want to speak to it, Karen, or take it as well? Um, no, it really is the purpose of uh, the report is really just to um, to remind everybody, councillors and the community, that uh, we have an election coming up later this year and uh, just getting, we're just starting work, um, officers just starting work on that now. Um, there's a long lead in time needed and so we just wanted to bring this to your attention and to advise on our uh, uh, elections officer and Harriet's our deputy elections officer um, and there's the rest of the information and the key dates in there for your information so I'm happy to take any questions. So any questions? There is none, it's very self-explanatory so uh, it's, it's for information um, so look, I'm happy to move the recommendation of somebody to second it, Councillor Marlon. If there's no further dis any discussion, no. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your right hand. Against, carried. Moving on. Sorry, did you have your hand up, David? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you wanted to say something. Moving on now to page two one nine, uh, the chief executive's report. I will hand over to David to take us through his report. Yes, well, um, the, the, we've had quite a lot happen over the, over the last um, few weeks. Um, one, the big issue we've had, and which we've been focusing on um, in the last couple of weeks is the, the big rainfall event. Um, we had uh, over 100, or 190 mils of rain in, in 48 hours. Um, that was on top of the hundred, the four inches or hundred mils we had the week before, and another thirty uh, the week after. Um, those are significant amounts of rainfall. Um, biggest 
sort of flood event we've had in, in 16 years. Um, we, it did cause some um, significant flooding around the district. Um, areas that, um, a, a lot of areas performed well um, compared to last event, but there were areas that um, were, um, we, we, we need some improvement. Um, the retention dam on Fifth Street, this is the first time it was fully tested. Um, it did actually fill completely up and reach capacity with overflow. It, it did deliver on um, flattening out to those peaks that the, the, the storm event happened, but it did also um, result in quite a stream down to Rory Road, which is um, a, a real sign of how significant that event was. Um, we did have some um, real issues with our wastewater system being overwhelmed. This caused a number of problems for our, our properties um, around the, the district, but mainly um, in the um, on the edges of the town to the um, to the west. I'm um, sorry, to the east of town. Um, we had to have portaloos out. They were deployed for quite a period. There were some um, a, a number of overflows. Um, yeah, we've got some work to do uh, associated with that. Um, and it just highlights that uh, we've got an ongoing program of work to actually keep on top of our, um, the, our wastewater system. Um, out in the rural area, we had a, a number of um, slips and culvert failures that are sort of listed there. Um, a major issue for us was is the Clumber Road Bridge. Um, that was, um, we, we've started that work on, on replacing that bridge um, and it was under being monitored 24-7 um, with telemetry. It, it did show that it, it had a bit of a, it got a bit of a hammering through that. We're still doing an inspection. We, we're waiting for an engineer's report um, to determine if, if that bridge can be safely reopened or if we're going to have a, um, a one-way system continue until the new bridge is, is fabricated. That's, I haven't had an update yet from our engineers on that. Um, the other major issue that the council is dealing with um, operationally is, is again is COVID. Um, we're acutely aware that we've got really critical services um, that we have to deliver. So we, we're working we're under a, a, a management or a business plan that um, makes sure that our critical workers are as, as uh, separated as possible so that if we do uh, or when we get COVID um, in our business, um, we can still deliver on those critical services. It, would, um, it is key to point out that if, if we do struggle with um, staffing in, in the library or the event centre, we will be looking at closing those if we can't um, or limiting hours. But our intention at the moment is to keep business as usual and we have been able to do that to date. Um, the rest of the report, um, there's a number of different things there about the future of local government and, and three waters and Aratoi. Um, I will take that as read, but I'm opening open to any questions anyone will have. Thank you, David. And so, is there any questions that uh, councillors have of David from his report? Councillor Deval? Uh, You've gone back on your mute. Sorry. Sorry. Again. Oh, sorry. No, you've gone back on mute again. Yes, David? You're Hello? Right. Yes, you're right. You can hear me now. Uh, David, uh, just on page 227 on the Douglas Villa situation, uh, I've been I've had a couple of phone calls over the last couple of days from very concerned members of that club that their season is basically, well, their training season has basically started and they're, um, by the time uh, March comes around when the, the upper floor will not be available, there's going to be... Uh, two or three games of, of club soccer being played there on Saturdays, and they're not if they're not going to be able to use the upper floor, they're very concerned about the fact that they're just going to have nowhere to, to uh, host the visiting teams. And I'm just wondering, is there any possibility of all that that can be uh, hurried a little bit and that 
and that they can be given a bit uh, a bit of leeway in terms of time um, to get that work done. Yeah, uh, Corin, can you can you? Yeah, I'll, ju I'll I'll jump in there. Um, I I thought you would come in on the on this one, Gary, and um, uh, the um, the information came as a, as a surprise to me too. So. I mean, this is the mark of Alistair coming on board um, and doing exactly what he's supposed to do um, and looking at and picking up these pieces of work. So um, neither the ground floor or the upper floor has a, a certificate of public use, which means effectively uh, we, we can't, um, uh, without those certificates, uh, give permission for the space to be used. Um, we would hold liability if something was then to go wrong, like a fire or any any of those things. Um, Alistair has engaged immediately uh, builders to begin work, um, and the the ground floor is is the easier and more immediate in terms of like getting the shell block and those pieces um, uh, ready. We are working as quickly as we can to try and get it um, to get those certificates. But the upper floor is gonna take quite a bit of work. It needs a, like a, a, a fire, um, correct fire ceiling. Um, it needs the right alarms put in, uh, et cetera. So um, we're pushing as fast as we can. Um, we will hit, um, as you can probably appreciate, uh, potentially issues around materials as well right now, which doesn't help. Um, but yeah, please be assured we are, pushing this one as fast as we can because um, we want to have the least amount of inconvenience, but I have to say that our upper floor, um, it, it could be an issue getting that um, ready in time. Thank you, Corin. Could I, could, I just, could I just sort of plead with you, if you would, if you could uh, uh, also contact the Douglas Villa uh, people and just give them, give them that, that assurance um, they're very concerned, obviously, because yep. uh, the upper floor is where the bar and, and where the, the money-making places are, and uh, um, they, they see themselves being really, uh, really hurt in that respect. So, uh, no, I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Councillor, and I'll do that. Um, we've held off on going back to them because we wanted to inform um, councillors uh, first, but um, they've obviously had that initial verbal conversation, and we'll be following up with that immediately with them. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so there's a few hands up now. Um, David Holmes, then Fraser, and then Tom. Oh, just David, I wonder if we could have a um, council update one day about all the damage that's that's happened in, in um, the last week because, as you know, a few of us went for a look around in the flood and, and there's some suggestions that you possibly might have seen, but I'm just wondering if we could have a, some sort of a workshop just briefly one day with an update of everything. Thank you. Thank you for raising it, David. I have asked the Chief at Zeke um, that we have a workshop um, yep. on it. Um, obviously, not just now, because the staff are under the pump addressing oh, really? some issues. But I think you're right. We do need to um, have an understanding of why things have happened the way that they have and what can or cannot be done um, in, in the future. So, yes. Yeah. No, that's good. I mentioned yeah. earlier on about the winter coming on and so forth. So, and also there's carp escape from the lake as well. So that's all under control. Thank you. Okay. Fraser? Yeah, it's not a question for David, but just sort of suggestion for Gary that perhaps he um, redirects Douglas Park to go and have a chat with um, either Pioneer Club rooms or the netball courts, and they might be able to uh, provide some space for them to entertain their, the visiting teams. Just a thought. Excellent idea. Gary, you're on mute. Did you come back on that? Sorry, thank you, thank you, Fraser, for that. But I think you'll find that they might have uh, they might have uh, gone down that road. But however, uh, that, that, that's a good thought. Uh, it just it just if it if it's only going to be the the very first part of the season, that it could work out. But you can understand Douglas Villa have I, I think it's an incredible number of teams, something like well over 20, 30 teams, and uh, that's a very busy place during the winter time. But but thanks for that suggestion. Tim, did you want to speak? Oh, it's the same point as um, Gary's and Fraser's. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sam, uh, Councillor Ryan. <clears throat> Thanks, Mayor. Question for Corin, page 225, the Ngāti Tukuro Reserve, which I, I you're talking about the reserve between 3rd and 4th Street, right? No, no, no. Yeah. no. Sorry. Uh, 
Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Yes. So it says there that you're planning an interactive community space. Just describe to me what what your what the plans are. <laughs> um, can I come back to you on that one, councillor? Um, I need to get a, to give you a detailed explanation. I need to come back and and get that for you, and I'll I'll do that. Can, can I ask that one of the one of the community development activators has, has offered to come to our next Lansdowne residence mm -hmm. meeting? Maybe that's the space we could do that because, of course, it is in our backyard. Yeah, absolutely, Ab absolutely, yeah. and and that's 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 absolutely perfect um, forum to do that. Thank you. Okay, is there any other uh, further questions of David from his report? No, there is not. So um, it's for information that we uh, note the information contained in the report. I'm happy to move. Is there a seconder? Thank you, David. Uh, Gary, you need to mute. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we receive the information, all those. Oh, sorry, Graham, did you put your hand up? No, all those in favour, please raise your right hand. Against, carry. Okay, you still got, sorry, Graham, you still got your hand up. On. Yeah, I just wanted to very quickly add that I actually visited some of the residents down Colombo Road at their request. Um, with sewer backups, and, and they were extremely um, complimentary of sea care contractors and, and the effort they'd put in down there. So sometimes, you know, nobody, people overlook the guys that actually have to go out in the rain and sort these things. So that's all I wanted to say. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the Mayor's report, and as you're aware, it's just a verbal one. And I'll just find my notes, which I've put down somewhere, and now I can't find them. Sorry, just give me a minute here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so really I just had a few things to mention and that is you'd be aware on Stella that new folders have been set up for the um, resource management reforms and for the future for local government as well. The Three Waters has been there for quite some time. I just really strongly, for those that um, that you all become familiar very much. These are living um, live reforms that will have a big impact, not only on local government, but our communities. So we need to be over them as much as we can. We've got the Future for Local Government panel coming in mid-March to talk to us. So it would be really good. I know a few councillors, and I think I've put Fraser and Tina's, uh, some of their notes up on Stella as well. I've asked a GNZ whether they've been recorded. I understand they have, but I haven't had the link yet. So when I get that link, I'll send it all out to you. I've been unable to watch any of them because they're on the day that the three was working very fast, so, um, which is why I need to look at them. I'm going to send a link out on the re, uh, resource management reforms from the steering group that's been established. It's um, been led co-chaired by Mayor uh, Toby Adams from Haraki and I'm sorry I've forgotten the woman's name from the Ministry uh, from the Environment. So they were really keen to establish a steering group very early on given the, what happened with the three waters on how what does a local um, voice look like in, in these reforms and how the linkages are not only to the RM reforms, but also linkages in the future, con connections to the future for local government and possibly even through waters. So hugely important. The um, recording that I'm sending out, it's not very long, I think it's about half an hour or 40 minutes, and it's speakers are the, the co-chairs of the group, uh, LGNZ policy staff, um, so very easy to listen to. So I really encourage you. I'm trying to get them to be able to download those recordings on Zoom, but we haven't um, staff haven't quite figured out how hey, we can do that. But so I want to send the link out um, out to you. So really, that was um, all from me. 
uh, and it, it is it is a busy time uh, with all these reforms that are sitting over, and I accept and appreciate the work that uh, Councillor Marvin and Councillor Lipson are doing, especially around the um, review of the district plan. And I know, uh, Chris, from your background, looking at it from your involvement in the development of the Wadanapa combined district plan, it's, it's extremely time consuming and there's a lot of reading, reading to be done. So um, thank you everyone for that. So uh, yeah, and the work that's been done on refugees, um, Sandy, it's, uh, you know, I'm really excited about, um, you know, the work that's going ahead and what it will mean to our community. So I look forward to ongoing discussions about that. So on that note, that was all I had to say. So I will now um, close the public uh, component of the meeting and ask if somebody would like to move that we move to public exclusion. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Seconder. Seconder to Council, uh, Councillor McLean. Okay, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Again, sorry, hands up. Again, carry. So if you'll go back and